Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, you know, I invited folks together today with the intent of sharing specific challenges that we face in Winooski, probably not specifically in Winooski, um, kind of focused on the intersection of workforce development, housing, transportation, um, to lift up where specific federal actions could be helpful. So this is just like an information sharing session, not an endorsement or anything like that by attendees or their organizations. Um, so we're just here to talk about, you know, what are the problems we are, the biggest challenges we're facing in Winooski and, and how we might be able to move those forward. Um, yeah, I'll just say a, a few words. I, uh, I, I'm amazed at Winooski, I really am, because uh, you know, I went out when you were uh, beginning construction on the, 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 the uh, I don't know, do you call it new or renovation or it's new both. slash, it's both. <laughs> yeah. But I, I also remember back um, years ago when I walked around, I think, with you, Dee, mm -hmm. and I was just astonished at the number of languages that uh, were spoken at the Winnesee schools. And this is like the melting pot, you know, of Vermont. And uh, it's just such a community in transition where the challenges that you face are in many ways unique to uh, an intense here in Winooski, much more so than many other. It's not unique because these are challenges all around the state, but it's very intense here. And I, I just have this still memory, Christine, of going out to the school and asking teachers, how in the world do you teach somebody who shows up, young child and speaks no uh, English at all in a language that not, not many of us speak, and somehow you, you found a way to do it. And uh, you've had to contend with all these challenges in this community that's really changing, and it's amidst escalating real estate values, it's amidst uh, worker shortage, um, it's in, it, it, with, in, with the pressures of um, uh, COVID. So I just have always been really an admirer of how some, somehow, some way you all have managed to uh, uh, to keep taking a step forward and maintain community support, and that's uh, really hard. I remember going out to the school too at the beginning of COVID, where uh, you were having such an elaborate uh, uh, effort involving the staff and separating uh, students enough so they had enough distance. And I just know that takes a toll when it goes on for a couple of years. Uh, so, just as a person who's been stopping by. Uh, and not had to do the hard work day in and day out. Uh, I just want to salute you and I look forward to uh, hearing how things are going. Thank you. And you've contended with being in the legislature <laughs> too. I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Taylor, I appreciate it. Yeah, these problems Thanks. require local, state, and yeah. federal yeah. 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 cooperation. Dee, can you get us started and talk about some of your primary concerns around the housing? Sure. Um, Thanks for coming, really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, that's good to be here. And uh, you know, I, I have to say, having worked in Winooski and Services, it's the honor of my life to be able to serve the community I grew up in. So, so <laughs> as much as um, now that's the right attitude for yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and I and I bet to all of us, we would say the same thing. It's an right. honor to serve the folks we right. get to work with. Um, I'm now the executive director of the Housing Authority, and so I had my first glance, my first glimpse into the regulatory environment at the federal level and how it's not keeping up with the real challenges that are on right. the ground, right? Um, we, and, and just financially, we got 3.5% rent increases and an 8.5% inflation environment. So, wow. yeah. you know, um, and we moved to the RAD program, which is out of public housing and into a private model, um, thinking that that was going to help, but when, you, when you're not keeping up, um, you know, but we're figuring it out because we're Winooski and we're small enough to talk to each other and figure it out. So um, I, I would say that, you know, our big challenge is losing affordable families housing mm -hmm. because that touches everything, right? Because your, your folks who we need to, to do a lot of our frontline work, um, your housekeepers, your um, wait, wait staff, whatever, are off, there are not people that are going to want a $1,800 a month one bedroom apartment right. which we're building. We need, we need three plus bedroom homes to, to house folks. So, um, you know, any support, but the money comes in seems to be developing these one bedroom homes. And, um, you know, that's kind of a not, I'd like to, you know, figure it out. You need it for family. 
if, if we're going to have all those frontline staff and we're going to continue to ref to to welcome folks in the refugee resettlement program, we need that inventory. It's it, we can't we can't do it with just one bedrooms. It's not that the one bedrooms are bad; um, they're important, um, but they can't be the only thing. And because everything else is getting unaffordable because of just real estate values. Making sure we're paying attention to the affordable piece of, of that and the subsidized piece of that. The, the other thing I'm just going to throw out just as a challenge is the fact that the only tool I have for folks in mental health crisis, substance abuse, is eviction. The only tool I, I have. And when you do that, people lose their voucher and then they're just out of luck for sometimes the rest of their lives. And I would like to look at the federal government for you, for you folks to really think about letting that voucher follow people into transitional housing, maybe follow into single room occupancy supportive housing somehow, mm -hmm. uh, maybe go to assisted living, yeah. but let that voucher follow the person so it'll help fund the programs, it'll reduce the cost of those programs we want to run and keep people out of that eviction merry-go-round that ends up with, with people getting housed with a promise of support, having a mental health breakdown, refusing to get any support, causing a health or safety issue in an in a, in a apartment building, getting evicted, getting into the hotel, getting back into the cycle, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just a horrible cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think we can do better, just even just by letting those vouchers move with the person. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah that makes sense, because a lot of those folks end up then homeless, right? Oh. They almost always do. They almost always, if they, they can't make it, end up in a hotel or homeless. Um, related to that, yeah. I've heard from the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance that because of the federal definition of homelessness, um, they can't deploy resources to people that are facing homeless until they have a 14-day eviction or a 30-day notice to terminate. And so the help is coming too late to address if there is like a mental health issue or addiction issue and then like degrading conditions. Um, so they've raised that up as that definition is too narrow. Like, could that be expanded to kind of help get do more proactive homeless prevention? So how 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 would we change that definition in order to accommodate that? So, so what I've heard from the organization is that the. So that window is too narrow. You're probably not getting mm -hmm. the notice, though, with more than 30 right. days. Um, I think that's a really good question to, to But we can do follow-up. Can I yeah. help a little bit mm -hmm. with that? Because that's where we are, right? We, we can't get emergency support to a person until we're ready to evict them, because that's the trigger that suddenly brings out the troops to rescue the situation. But by then, the person's lost credibility, the, their neighbors are now afraid of them, you know, there's the whole set. So if it, it, preventing homelessness means that we have, to, I think, we have to identify early in the process, way, give us a tool other than eviction, way earlier in the process. And even if it's, like I said, the voucher could follow a person into another right. house situation, rather than having to make somebody homeless or threaten to make somebody homeless. Mm -hmm. So, because we work with these folks all the time, and they're great, but you have to have a crisis in order to, to trigger everything that needs to happen, and that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the person, it's not good for the, you know, for well, the, the whole, neighbors. The whole eviction is just, that's, that's like an admission of fail, failure. It, right? we, we're failing mm -hmm. folks left and right yeah. because that's the only tool we have, yeah. and, and it does. I mean, it brings folks along. These, these folks are, are great, but why do we have to get there? Right. Right. We need like an at-risk definition. We, we, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was thinking of like a probationary period that would allow for the funding to come in to have the supports but not be at the place of eviction where mm -hmm. you've already reached crisis level where there is no supports that can maintain that person in the housing, if I'm hearing you correctly. No, that's true. I mean, sometimes you're sitting or going, you know, I, I, you know, going, the only thing we can do is send an eviction notice because that's the only way we're going to get help into this situation. It almost created, we, a lot of times I feel like we see situations where we create, we wait for a crisis to create solutions, or like our, our solutions are crisis oriented. Or we become so used to a crisis that it becomes normal, 
and then so we, we function because that crisis is now our well, no, I, I, it's interesting listening to this because that, that that is a that's a real challenge and once they're out I mean first of all all that suffering that occurs on that floor not just with the family or the person that's in crisis but the neighbors who are freaked out and understandably so right because they're scared and you don't know what's going to happen so it just it really kind of erodes that sense of community or any chance of getting it uh, and then folks then end up out on the street, and uh, I mean, I mean, how, do you unwrap, how do you unwind that? Yeah. Well, I would just add the impact on learning. Mm -hmm. So when you have a family that gets in, uh, uh, evicted, um, you know, it's uh, through McKinney-Vento Act, uh, uh, which is great. It allows for some choices for family to continue and, and to provide that stability in education. However, there's not enough funding for that, which then it falls on the local school district to, to make up that gap. Um, in, in helping with transportation, you know, temporary housing, food, uh, whatever is needed um, to continue that. But, um, you know, the research will show when you have inconsistent uh, um, uh, education, and we have a pre-K-12 continuum, which is unique, uh, where students and families can live in our community for that whole entire time and be in the same system and have a coherent experience. So when they get pulled out of it, it can have devastating effects right. on a student's learning. So how, did, how does it work in school if there's somebody who's getting evicted, they've got a child or two who's in your, in your school, what happens? Well, as, as Dean said, sometimes they go to a hotel and they can continue. Um, and uh, we, we try to find other resources to, to help. Sometimes they'll move in with relatives or friends in other communities, in which case they want to continue to attend our school district. And so, uh, you know, through McKinney-Vento, we'll help with transportation and pay for that. And sometimes the only uh, that's a that's a huge burden for you. Yeah, is that? Yeah. I mean, just think about how hard it is for parents to get their kid to school if they live a little bit on the outskirts. And right now they're in another community. And right. You've got to arrange a pickup and a drop off. Yeah, and it's it's kind of a cascading effect of basic needs that start to happen. You know, when an eviction happens, it's it's food, it's clothing, it's transportation, it's. Um, access to uh, um, after school and pre-care, uh, all those types of supports that we have in place yeah. uh, across our city. Amazing. You're the boss here. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can go next. Are you, do you have um, some? I yeah. can go next. So, um, I'm here representing the downtown organization. Um, so we work with our business community, um, which is primarily in Winooski, small businesses. Um, and I'll say that um, we've been really, really impressed with the small businesses doing their piece. They're raising their wages, right. they're pivoting dramatically, it seems like every six months, to make sure that the safety of their employees and their customers is um, is there and is um, you know viable? They're looking at you know serving their customers in the way that their the customers need to be served. Right. But all these other pieces are what they need. So when we're looking at transportation or you know safety, um, we that's for their workers. So there's people that are you know having a job or they've had a job in Winooski for a long time, but because of transportation issues or because they were priced out of Chittenden County, they're not having to travel longer to get here. Um, and then once they get Get here if there's safety concerns because of whatever it is that's going on then they're less inclined to want to stay here and work here and so the businesses are doing their part they're really really trying um, but it's it needs all the other puzzle pieces so when you say there's a worker shortage there there definitely is um, but it's all dependent on childcare, on housing, on safety, on transportation, on all of these things. It's also looking at you know lower barriers to entry for these help programs that are happening. There's so much help pouring in from all these different directions, it seems like. And one of my roles has been kind of like taking in the fire hose and figuring out like how do I tell these to businesses um, what programs are available. And maybe it's from a private entity that's giving out a grant, or maybe it's a federal program, or maybe it's a state program, or a regional program. Um, and what we're finding over and over and over again is that eligibility isn't there, um, that the, the barriers to entry for these programs, where even if it's $5,000, it's pages and pages of applications, and they're like, 
I, I don't have, I'm a sole proprietor, or I have five staff members, I'm a, you know, I'm a single mom, or I'm, uh, you know, new American, so there's translation issues, and they can mm -hmm. do all the things to get that support, but by the time they've gotten it all, they've already, I mean, it's already over, it's like, it's, they've moved on, this. it's not worth this money, even though it is worth that money, they just can't do it, so lowering the barriers on a lot of these programming would also be incredibly helpful for our small business community, and the small businesses that we see in Winooski in particular, we are a dense urban area, we are different than other communities, but we have those small mom and pop businesses that every, you know, Vermont downtown has so we do right. still have that same spirit of Vermont um, we just happen to have a lot of BIPOC women owned new American businesses so those businesses need to be supported even more because mm -hmm. there's so many barriers anyway um, and so we're really trying hard we're all working you know we're working with a lot of different puzzle pieces a lot of different partner organizations and we're seeing that even when we're sweating you know, to get them this, this money, um, they're just unable to get it. So when we're looking to the future at continuing to see, say these buzzwords of like recovery and right. helping small businesses and sole proprietor and you know, women owned, BIPOC owned, um, the reality is that when you say those words, what it means is they have no capacity, zero capacity, emotional, physical, like any labor and all they're trying to do is serve their community mm -hmm. um so i do feel like all those pieces are like coming in but they're just not clicking into place in a way that's actually supporting the most vulnerable community um so again we're super proud of how Winooski has pivoted we've been incredibly resilient um but i'm worried you know we're still worried about kind of looking to the future and seeing um everyone's still kind of um you know, hanging on, and right. waiting for that turn, waiting for that shift in the river and yeah. the, everything to pick up again. You um, know, it almost sounds like it would be better to have like those programs funnel through like a, a regional uh, mm -hmm. or your organization where you're able right. to deal with uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the paperwork part of it. Right. It and there is a program like that with the, the um, yeah. charity, like the Navigator program, and yeah. they have some hubs and some different things. Um, but there's challenges there too, because a lot of those organizations are don't have capacity to, to execute these programs. So if you know, if my organization was handed a program, we would have to hire new staff. We would have to. So it's like it's all of these things. Like my goodness, if you would like to hand us a pot of money, we will take it. But we would have to do a lot of infrastructure building in order to actually get the money out in an equitable way. And that's the other part about this is that for our community in particular, equity and inclusion is incredibly important. It's not just a buzzword, it's a real thing. And it, you see it every single day. So again, lowering any barriers that we can, yeah. even though we wanna make sure that people are eligible. I get it. Right. You wanna make sure that people are using the money for the right reasons. I get it. Um, but ultimately, none of these businesses are trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. They're just trying to keep right. their doors open. They're trying to pay their employees. Um, and they're trying to serve their community. And a lot of our businesses are serving their minority businesses, serving a vulnerable population. So it's it's like not only are the businesses supporting themselves and their employees, they're supporting all the kids that walk by their school, their you know their store and walk to school, and then they hop in and, and get halal you know food for their family as on the way home. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. It's all connected. It's a web. It's I don't even know it's web. It's a tangled yeah. rope. <laughs> it's not as organized as a web. Um, but that's where you know I feel really strongly that every single piece of housing, of infrastructure, of everything, of the school that happens, childcare, all of that will support our business community, which this is not really a main thing, so I apologize for bringing it up, but um, thinking about the school, a huge problem that Vermont has in the workforce is kids leaving um, when they graduate. Um, and in Winooski, we do have a lot of jobs. We actually do have a lot of um, programming that's available for high school kids to kind of come in and go into a kitchen or go into a manufacturing right. um, facility. And we're not able to convince them to stay here, part in part because of housing, um, in part because of the culture of like everyone leaves. And so if we do have all those pieces in place, then we can also look to the next generation um, to kind of keep them here. Um, because if we want to keep that diversity and that strength of our communities, um, you know, when kids turn eight, Team, they leave the state that's not helping anyone um, so again kind of looking at that piece we you know we as an organization really look at that because we look at them as you know incredibly bright shining stars of the community right. that are you know we want them to stay and we're like but 
Um, and you know, full disclosure, I did that. <laughs> so I understand the, the draw of leaving, um, but there's so many ways that these different pieces can come together to also kind of help capture a major issue that I feel like you know, is difficult to talk about, right. um, but it's definitely facing Winooski hard. Thanks, Marianne. If I might yeah. add to that, just yeah. from like a perspective, I'm wearing a couple hats here at the table. But my, my day job, we see, you know, what Meredith is talking about in terms of um, like in government contracting, uh, the barriers to entry for small businesses are very high. Mm -hmm. um, everything that comes along with that, in terms of reporting after the fact or just really extensive RFPs is to some extent designed for large entities that have right. a person on staff that handles that kind of thing. Right. They've got the infrastructure. They've got the infrastructure. That. So it becomes incredibly difficult. And even with some of this federal funding going around, you know, that might be sent to local nonprofits mm -hmm. or then subcontracted out to maybe mm -hmm. non nonprofits. But the Treasury guidance follows the dollars all the way down the line and that gets tough. And it's not to say that those things aren't necessary. Uh, and they've got to be right sized. You know, the, the, uh, you know, an example I give is after the, uh, the financial collapse in 08, we needed significant regulations for the money center banks. Well, a lot of those money center bank regulations were on, you know, the local bank. They just followed them down and it made no sense in the threat of uh, a financial cat catastrophe uh, because a local bank made a bad loan was non-existent, different, obviously, for the Wall Street money center operations. I think we've rightly applied skepticism, you know. Uh, it's just an issue of, at a certain level, like you're pointing out, that it just isn't as warranted, or it's just, it, that adds just so much that it's a barrier that some people are capable of overcoming. Um, and so it's, it's something that I think we've been talking a lot about, is just this right sizing for right, right place. Uh, regulations. Right. No, that makes total sense to me. It really has. Well, and in a similar vein, we have organizations like mm -hmm. USCRI or AALV providing support to a lot of our residents, yeah. and and the um, the liaisons at the school district, and not specifically like looking for business help. Some can be because there's a lot of small business owners here, but going to these organizations looking for help trying to navigate these systems and access these programs. And then those organizations are under-resourced to provide that assistance. Right. Um, and I think there's an issue that I have heard with, this is true of support organizations and our public transportation is like, there's no real base funding. Uh -huh. um, and so they are operating on, you know, like for refugee resettlement, they're being right. paid per, resettled refugee, and so when refugee resettlement was kind of halted under the previous administration, yeah. their funding was gutted, and it, they I'm still not. haven't fully rebuilt their staff since oh, then. Oh, that's terrible. So they've got all the expenses associated mm -hmm. with the infrastructure. Yeah, and, and then, so it's been really hard to money. recover from that, yeah. That's interesting. And I think of this issue with transportation, like I hear from residents, I can't rely on it, this frequency of service isn't, um, it's not enough, or there's not a broad enough network. But there's, there's not enough passengers to make enough revenue to get there. Like there needs to be right. this, this sort of bridge yeah. to like get the service level that would drive then the usage. I think we're in a difficult situation where everybody wants expanded service. Um, you know, they want expanded dependability. They want um, you know strong compensation for everyone involved in offering that service. And then they also want the service to be free. This is what we've, we've right. heard repeatedly. And, Thankfully, the legislature did provide funding that we could extend the service free. Um, however, you know, there's workforce challenges that are, you know, not unique to, you know, the transit sector, but are, you know, very apparent, especially because that's a slightly aging workforce. Um, you know, it, we see a lot of our, our, our drivers are retiring or folks in the maintenance division are right. retiring. Well, that's happened in schools too, isn't it? But yeah. then, the big problem with uh, getting drivers through the school buses. So, CDLs, so I imagine that would be similar. Yeah. In, in terms of federal, you know, yeah. um, legislation, I mean, one thing we we've, we've seen kind of repeatedly is just CDLs are are very difficult for folks to talk about high kind of going back to what I was saying, a high activation Aaron, energy. Yeah. We've really professionalized CDL driving to a point where it's very difficult, and 
um, in Winooski, and there's been a number of new Americans who would love to be CDL drivers. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to learn, at, you know, how to get your CDL when English is your second or third or fourth language, um, and there aren't many resources nearby that can allow the person to to get their CDL. So you think even that's if they might have wherever they've they've moved so the from, the requirements are excessive. Yeah, it can be a safe driver. Just, just for to go. never mind language. I, I managed transportation and parking at UVM before I came to the city. I couldn't pass the CDL. It was just way more than I could do with in my spare time. It was just it's very what part of the you pass? What is there? We finally found what Dick can't pass. It's <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. Um, uh, no, I'm, actually, I get confronted with that almost every day. No, I, I but. <laughs> No, but seriously, what was it? That, what it, it was, elements of is it the written test or what? I, I I couldn't get there because I couldn't get through the manual and all of the you know you have to know all sorts of mechanical pieces of it unless you have somebody showing you what they are and, and naming them and that's that wasn't my background. Now, if that was the only thing I was doing and I was hired as a driver, could I have passed the test? Probably, right, but, but I we should have, we, couldn't do it. It's, like, full -time. it's like you're telling me there are mechanical skills that are being tested when all you need to do is drive safely. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to fix my car. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been driving for a long time, but I, and so you can say all you want about land, and I, I, I can't imagine the language on top of that, but I, just, just for perspective, mm -hmm. I gave up. It was like something I badly wanted to do just because I'm esprit de corps and Right. It was like I never. Sean, do you want to weigh in on the experience you've had? Sure. Yeah, and I think think about this as uh, an example of how, for years, leaders in Winooski have done things way outside of our our expected scope um, and missions in our particular organizations to serve our residents. To do what needed to be done because. Number one, either there was massive barriers at the state and federal level, or there just was no ability to be able to do it or understanding of how to do it to meet the needs of our particular community. So this is just the example of transportation, but I think everybody could speak to other examples. So, um, you know, we've been working on student transportation for years and kind of ramping it on. It's a huge issue for our families in terms of safety, particularly in the winter, you know, when sidewalks don't get... Uh, plowed on time, you know, and it's not anybody's fault. It might be the way the snow fell that day. Uh, it could be resources as well. And we have kids walking in the streets because they're plowed, and which is really, really dangerous. And many of our students live down in this part of the city, which is one of the furthest points to the school. So they're walking up, uh, you know, through the entire city, right. and it's unsafe. Wow. Um, the other part is getting kids to school on time. Uh, so that they can maximize their learning and instruction for teachers and the continuity and those routines that are really important for learning. So we've been working on that. We started to implement that uh, and then COVID came and it basically all shut down. And then with the staffing shortages that have been referenced, um, we found ourselves in a position of like, there's, we're not gonna get back to transportation. You know, the private providers, our neighboring school districts who have worked with us before that run their own transportation, they all looked at us and said, sorry, we've got nothing for you. So this is the example of going outside of our scope. We, we took money from fund balance and we granted a local community organizing group of parents and youth. And um, they have been supporting uh, local residents in uh, uh, working towards their school bus driver licenses, which Somebody could tell you. I think Nicole Mace knows more about this. Our uh, finance Wait, who are they operations. Who to get the licenses? Who, who will get it? Well, we had we were working with local Winooski folks who wanted yeah. to do it, and I basically see. they wanted to do it to serve their community. Right. Some of them who are through the process, they're they're uh, giving up higher paying, more benefit jobs to yeah. do this just to serve their community wow. because they realize the safety and the learning implications of not doing it. Um, so Nicole Mace, our, our finance and operations director, has done a fabulous job, and mm -hmm. she pulled DMV into it, who was very responsive. But it's an example of like we have to go out and grab all these people, yeah. bring them to the table, make them responsible for contributing to the process. And if there was regional or state level, more universal systems to do this, 
then we could actually do our core functions yeah. mm -hmm. and our core job. Um, so right now, I mean, we're in a position where we've worked so hard on this and we've spent countless hours and, and dollars, uh, um, you know, outside of kind of our core mission to provide this and we're getting close, um, but we're still not there and it's been an incredibly heavy lift. Um, I brought together several cabinet members a year and a half ago, um, you know, from transportation and labor and education and, and they were helpful. Uh, and I think this is where I would ask for you, for your help too. Yeah, uh, uh, is um, there's barriers at the state level, but mm -hmm. there's also barriers at the federal level that trickle down. Right. You know that say like you can't you can't give a test in another language than English. Uh, or, or you can't have any. Uh, so that's uh, a federal barrier. Yes, you can't have any support like through interpretation or uh, transcription of of a test. And there's what five to seven different tests that are yeah, required state and federally in order to get a license to drive a bus. Drive a bus. Now, safety is you know, obviously it's, enormous, it's, but Sean, the red be, tape is just unbelievable. What, would be, what really would be helpful would be to just get you know a case study of that. Mm -hmm. You know where it, 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 what you told me just makes my head explode. All right, but to move on it, I would need like an example from A to Z or yep. A to M, whatever it was. Because most of my colleagues would not be for that, and there's another agenda there. Mm -hmm. It's all in the immigration debate and right. southern border stuff. I mean, this the stuff that gets injected into places that doesn't belong. I mean, we have an issue on the southern border, but we're not gonna solve it by making it impossible for, Winooski, for Winooski to hire a bus driver. Right. Okay. Well, I'd also say- but, but that case study, yeah. where that's what allows me to get very concrete. Mm -hmm. Because this regulation issue really is something that cuts across all kinds of uh, sectors. And like the local bankers were having a similar problem with these J.P. Morgan style regulation requirements when it's a small community bank. And now these um, issues that don't have anything to do with the safety of operation, but they have to do with other, other agendas. Yeah. Generally, most people in public office don't want that stuff to be such an impediment. Mm -hmm. But being able to be concrete would really be helpful, a case study, if you know we can follow up um, on that, but that would really be helpful. Yep. We can you know, I'm, I'm kind of diverting a little bit back to you. I just am amazed at um, how the uh, last resort is like uh, the school to just pick up the pieces. Um, or the housing authority when somebody, you can't do anything in time, you have to wait till there's an eviction and everything gets more aggravated, but it, it becomes your problem even though it's not your job. And I don't know, Christine, is that really a big issue for, for the city? I mean, it, I mean, it must be. I mean, 100%. Like, like this a lot. Over, over complicated barriers <clears throat> and then underfunding at levels above us, everything trickles down here where we're day to day seeing people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's struggles in housing mm -hmm. because the program is underfunded. Um, people are actually, okay, so like SNAP benefits only cover food. Mm -hmm. You've got folks in highly, like super low income households who can't afford um, hygiene products and those aren't covered. Mm -hmm. And so this contributes to like degrading quality issues in a household. The lack right. of funding or priority. So, could federal funding towards housing somehow prioritize or incentivize three bedroom mm -hmm. or larger housing? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have enough of that locally. And so, we have large families living in unsafe conditions. Mm -hmm. And so, you, these are two contributors to code violations or mm -hmm. like quality issues that then we're spending tons of staff time and resources trying to resolve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no, there is not consistently translation or interpretation available for federal mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. and access. You know, we've got these underfunded organizations locally with USARA and ALV filling mm -hmm. that gap, but then there's still a gap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to work on that for our own services that we provide, right. but we're also helping people access these other services. Mm -hmm. But in the way that you said that the Winooski has everything kind of turned up, the volumes turned up, 
we do have the flip of the state, right? For we have sixty percent or more of our residents are renting, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of Vermont is homeowners. And then we also have a disproportionate number of people who are um, receiving benefits or not for disability. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then we also have a disproportionate, um, you know. A group of people that English is their seventh language. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about all these different factors also stacking up, um, which is mm -hmm. difficult for <laughs> someone talking about Vermont uh, because it's not something that necessarily the rest of Vermont is facing, but like you said, it is something that they are mm -hmm. facing. We just have dialed it up uh, to quite a degree. <laughs> and I said maybe, hopefully, we might be on the leading edge. You know, I think uh, not, I think that. Hopefully we are a state that can welcome more people in the coming years, and hopefully the lessons we learn here can be packaged up and right. transported mm -hmm. out to the other mm -hmm. corners of Vermont. So if we can have you know, the assistance to, to conquer those challenges here, then we can, we can do the nitty gritty for everybody yeah. else mm -hmm. five, 10 That's years ahead point. of the curve. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Talk about case so what's the state doing in, you know, in, in relationship to all of this? I mean, obviously you're center of the storm here and then <laughs> And, I mean, in relation to all of this, I think what we've done is do federal funding and having it go down to the municipal level. But just to the piece on Winooski, this community is so resilient. Mm -hmm. It has come together. What you heard from each of these stories and what I hear constantly is we saw the problem, we brought everyone to the table who needed to be there, and we came up with a solution. Does, should it be that way? Potentially, yes. I think we should all have these community solutions in place, but Winooski shouldn't have to be resilient every single time. We should be funded to the, the level where yeah. we're addressing all of these barriers yeah. when it comes to rental protections, uh -huh. especially when it comes to new Americans who don't necessarily know their rights as tenants, mm -hmm. um, had limited support during the pandemic because of that decreased funding for USCRI mm -hmm. and having ALV not necessarily be able to step in and then facing eviction and not knowing that process, but right. learning that they might not be able to bring their kids to the same school district that's been supporting them, also receiving the services that were giving them the information mm -hmm. that was culturally relevant around COVID. Mm -hmm. um, all of these pieces are so challenging. And I think there is a lot that we can do on the state level, especially when it comes to funding and making sure that our municipalities are like, uh, <laughs> Solid in their response, so that everyone else can have the community that Winooski does. Yeah, but although, although Winooski, you know, to me, you've got an you've got an administrative infrastructure that you've built up over time, and a lot of our towns don't have. But you know, it's a real validation for the Bernie, Patrick, and I all really want to have maximum flexibility for the state and the municipalities to be making the allocation decisions. Yeah. And I think where we're seeing a growing concern, and I think COVID really illuminated for a lot of folks our mental health challenges and the barriers that those present and being able to access the services or being able to talk openly about the services that are needed, especially around substance use disorder. I know we just did a, a tour of some of the businesses downtown and we were hearing about the safety issues. The safety being that there are folks who are using openly um, because they have nowhere else to go, but it's also the safest option, especially in a, a market that is so predominantly filled with fentanyl, where folks who are using are then dying. Um, before we were talking about substance use as a, a disorder, a long-term, how do we get people into treatment? But now I think we've gotten to this crisis point that we've stayed there to the point that now we don't even get to talk about getting folks into treatment because we're so focused on trying to keep folks alive. Mm -hmm. And so by using openly, they know that they're going to be in a place where if they were to overdose, they would be found by a community member. Mm -hmm. And the businesses here aren't upset about it. They're upset that there aren't additional services in mm -hmm. place to support those folks or to have a God, place. That is so hard. I mean, I, I, on site. that topic, I mean, what, what do we do? You know, I, I, we've got an apartment right across the city hall park and uh, there's people openly using in city hall park now i was walking through with my granddaughter and saw somebody literally shooting up and that's that's not sustainable mm -hmm. at all and i don't know what I, I mean well if we gave them a safe place such as an overdose prevention site um, where it's embedded within the community mm -hmm. um, where we have workers that are able to talk about treatment that are allowing folks to be able to test their supply so they know what they're using um, yeah, is really because otherwise we're going to continue to see this. Mm -hmm. Where if we know it's going to happen, why would we not create a safe infrastructure for people to use rather than continuing to stigmatize and expose mm -hmm. our youth to exactly what is happening in our communities? Mm -hmm.
yeah. and talking about the housing thing, that kind of buffer time, you're talking about someone that's using and then things in their life are you know going on downhill, they get evicted, now they're in City Hall Park, <laughs> now they're in mm -hmm. a garage, you know, they're, so talking about the, the all, again, all the pieces are part of the puzzle. Well, and the one thing we haven't touched on is the flip side, we need these services to fill these gaps because of wage suppression. Mm -hmm. um, I have people reaching out to me like, my rent's being increased, you know, whatever is behind that mm -hmm. is debatable, um, but my salary hasn't gone up and is already right. too low. You know, we have, we've had economic growth for years and nobody is seeing that at home and that continued stress, like, it feeds into the mental health and substance use disorder. Um, it's, we're, we're filling gaps, I think that's, yeah. I think that's right, because I, I think, uh, you know, when I think about substance abuse, it's really important, and I've always supported uh, counseling and, and mental health services. But I also think a lot of the challenge is, re is rebuilding communities, so that mm -hmm. the community, in just an organic way, can be somewhat supportive, like at a school. You know, kids have challenges, and it's not all resolved just by going to see the mental health counselor. It's like the teachers getting involved and giving them some uh, hope that they can be somebody. And, and yeah, for working. young people, it's a, it's about having teams of trusted, um, you know, expert adults, whether that's parents, teachers, coaches, neighbors. You know, kids have to feel cared about by the adults in their community, right. and they right. tend to make a lot better decisions. And then the second piece is developmental assets. You have to have, you know, not just the, the school curriculum, but you have to have other opportunities for students to engage, you know, uh, athletically, artistically, uh, collaboratively um, in the community. And those, yeah. are, those are the things that stop, <laughs> you know, they, yeah, like they the reduce the probability. You know what I mean? That's, yes. that, that, see, I think it's gotten hollowed out. And then when uh, means we're weight suppression or inflation, it, it really is tough. I mean, if you're working hard and you can't make the bills at the end of the month, that's a pretty discouraging thing, especially if you've got dependents. Mm -hmm. And it goes full circle to what Meredith was saying before of, why do we see young people leaving Vermont? Mm -hmm. Because entry-level jobs are some of the lowest paying. And how long do you have to stay in that position before you get an increase or before you're able to elevate yeah. um, in the workforce to a place where you're yeah. not having to rent anymore and build equity within a home? Um, it's much longer when you stay here versus mm -hmm. when you leave and then eventually come back, as yep. most people do. If I could add stat to that, our voucher acceptance rate. So once we gave a person a voucher, 90% of the time they found housing before COVID. We're Puts in around 25%. Wow. So the one thing that may actually solve and stabilize housing, people cannot find the compliant housing we need. So they may be housed, but they may be six people living in a two bedroom house and now we can't fund that because they can't stay where they are and take the voucher. Or mm -hmm. um, you know, they may be living with someone, but you know, they may be living in substandard housing. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons, but to me, one of the scariest numbers I look at in every day is, is the percentage of people who are offered vouchers and can't use them. Yeah. And when you're down around 25%, wow. when you've always been at 90, 90%, there's something fundamental. Wait, 90% is what? So, so what happens is you get to the top of the list and we offer you a voucher, and then you go out and find where you want to live and then agree with a with a landlord and then you get your, your house. So you move from getting your technical voucher to getting your housing. I see, yeah. And in, you get 90 days to do that, we extend it. And in the past, once you got to the top, you were the goal. I mean, you could find a place to live and you were, you were wow. there. Right now, we're offering vouchers left and right and trying to find people. We're, we're, we're giving priority to people. No, I get it. So getting a voucher used to mean you got a home. Now it getting a voucher doesn't means mean that you've, at got all a, right you've got a one in four shot at getting a home. You've got a one in four shot of finding something that... that I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, and it's, I think... And that's you, the housing shortage. It's the housing shortage, but it's also the number of apartments that used to allow and accept the subsidy who have now priced themselves out. So landlords mm -hmm. know that you can't not accept Section 8. You can know that the highest will go is $1,818, and so you, you raise your rent to $1,850 so that 
Right. Okay, so you haven't said you're not taking it. No, but you're, not you're, taking you're it. controlling it. Yeah. And so, and we are losing, um, we are losing a lot of those properties where they're still renting, but they're just getting, they're able, um, they get able to get two thousand dollars on the market. We're able to legally pay eighteen. Right. And that includes um, uh, utilities. Mm -hmm. So we're just. That that is that right there is is killing us now. On, on the other side, and and you know we sit here and we go, oh, we work together extremely well. You know we all have each other's cell phones numbers. We all text each other, and that's really our strength and how we how we survive in this. Um, I've got a really cool project with Sean's. Um, they have a co-op program, and the kids are learning all their English, math, science. Through helping us develop a playground at, at our property, really? and they're doing all of the work behind surveying That's people, so cool. and then we'll put them in they touch are. with landscape architects so they'll learn. You know, and, I mean, we and just get a so chance cool. to do this. What's, awesome. that, what's that program? That's amazing. It's, it's just something we. It's something that Sean's folks came and said, "Do you guys have a project?" And we were, I like, well, we want to do this, and it was just like happened in Scout Coffee Shop in about 20 minutes. It's a couple of teachers who are, it's kind of a school within a school. It's called yeah. the Onion River uh, yeah. program. And uh, the idea, it's multidisciplinary um, and wow. proficiency based and more experiential. And it's kind of in a pilot phase at this, at this yeah. moment, but um, it's a great, great project. That that really sounds cool, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So, so there are just there's a lot of really cool things we're 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 able to do, but just as much as you know when you fund and and authorize states to get a certain amount of money, and then there's this minimal amount that you get to small states, so that small states aren't because if you you know New York getting a certain amount. For, per person and Vermont getting a certain amount per person doesn't allow you to do it's the, the same base thing for the scale of right. right because of scale right I mean at some point you can hire the person who can write the grant who can get you more money well we're we're that small mm -hmm. town in the middle of Chittenden County where everything shows because we're all neighbors mm -hmm. so you don't get to ignore a problem because it's in another neighborhood that you never go to we don't get to do that here I actually live down here is my favorite place in the bottle of living down. <laughs> um, but, but we also just don't have the scale, so when we get funded like everyone else, we can. And a perfect example is Burlington Housing has all kinds of services around housing retention, and uh, I can't afford to do that. Right. You know, I, I can right. maintain safe, affordable, decent housing and a few things. So. Um, Maybe some help with that scale when it comes to, and that's a state issue as much as it's a federal issue, but paying attention to, we, we can't get the same level of funding and necessarily achieve the same level of outcome. Right. Do you I want to wrap this up? Going. Yeah, I know yeah. you've got another thing to do. You'll wrap this up? I really appreciate all of you taking the time to share. I have been taking notes. I'm going to try to clean this up so that you have something to reference um, moving forward and share with colleagues. Well, it's really wonderful. Thank you for taking all the time, but, you know, resources, you always need that. Cutting red tape, you need, you need that. Uh, and having models that fit the reality of the situation you're dealing with, you need that. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to wait till the eviction. And then you have to have these other services that go in place, and it's much more difficult to have an outcome. So I get the message. But um, I want to end where we began. I, I love coming to Winooski. It's really amazing to see what you all are doing. And uh, i got to come back to your school and see... Uh, the finished piece. See the finished piece. It's, it's pretty cool. I always enjoy seeing the students there and your teachers. It's really quite remarkable. So I just appreciate all that you guys are doing. And you have a lot to be proud of. And you have the hard work. I mean, our job in D.C. is to try to get the resources back here so you can do your work and the work uh, that you're being asked to do every day is what we, there's a word for it, impossible. <laughs> but, but somehow you manage to do it. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. This wonderful community has got uh, tremendous leadership. They must love representing it. Oh, it is the I'm easiest familiar. job, I have to say, because of the love <laughs> that I have. Um, I shouldn't say easiest. <laughs> Easy to love this community, that's for yes. sure. Well, thank you all very much.